Hello, creative people. Welcome to Creative Conversations. My name is Hollis Citron, and we are so truly happy that you have chosen to spend this hour with us. So, a little background on the podcast. I am owner and founder of I Am Creative and Express Yourself Publishing. My mission is to expand that quote-unquote societal definition of creativity beyond a pencil and a paintbrush and empower people, especially adults, to own their talents that come in so many different forms. So I've created this space so that I can get to talk to people that have all different jobs, hobbies, and interests, and we get to have a conversation about their experiences and perspectives all centered around three questions. One, how do you define creativity? Two, how do you incorporate it into your life? And three, why do you think it's important? Then we have a free-flowing conversation and we see where it goes from there. So I have had the honor to have spoken to entrepreneurs as young as 13, handwriting specialist, biologist, personal organizer, doctor, lawyer, and so many more. And the idea is that by sharing their stories, we get to explore the space of expressing yourself, giving yourself permission to take time for your interests and explore possibilities. And by doing all of this and incorporating it into your world daily, I promise you will feel more empowered, connected, and dare I say, happy. So, let me introduce my inspiring guest for today is Chuck Bean. He will tell you how he started his business career at age six, collecting golf balls at the local driving range for pennies. Soon after, he was selling golf balls to players on the local course and even beer. Today, Chuck specializes in developing and or tutoring growth strategies and delivering training and coaching in leadership, sales, communication, business value, um, I'm sorry, (laughs) business value, building, and teamwork. He is a no-nonsense and pragmatic and has helped people and corporations succeed for over 40 years. Chuck, welcome to the space. So you just need to press on that button on the bottom that says call in, tap here to call in, and I'll invite you up to the stage. Perfect. Hello, Chuck. Hey, how are you? Hello. Try this again. You got it. Okay, we're in. (laughs) You are in. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. So happy to have you here. We're thrilled to be here. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. Anytime I can blabber, I'm a happy camper. (laughs) We're going to have some good blabbering going on here. (laughs) So Chuck, why don't you tell people a little bit more about yourself? I mean, this whole starting at age six and let's share what you want to share right now. Well, it was a good way to, to buy pop and candy bars. You know, you could, uh, so <laughs> that's probably a little more marketing than than the, the reality. But I did, uh, yeah. You know, you'd go out there and and uh, pick up these golf balls by the by the bucket full and bring them in and cash them in for, well, I don't know, ten cents and and buy a an orange crush and and be out of there. I think it was. Uh, I did that for a long time, and then later on, I would be. Uh, I got into the habit of going out and picking up stray balls on the, I mean, there was nothing, I lived in the, in the middle of the country. There was really nothing else there and uh, pick up the stray balls and sell them back to the golfers on the, on the course. And, and there were a few times when we'd, we uh, I hope nobody actually listens to this, but we braid our, our friends, the uh, parents uh, fridge and, and sell a couple of <laughs> beers. Out there. You know, it was, uh, I was just terrible. I was the fourth child. Of five and and I, I think my my parents had given up. You know how it goes. Like <laughs> the, the first one is the the test case. The second one is the repair. The third one is is oh gosh. The fourth one is oh for, forget it. <laughs> and the fifth one is we better get it right this time. And so uh, you know I had a I had gosh like I worked <laughs> uh, I worked as a bouncer in a bar when I was fifteen. I, I lied about my age and. And uh, and did that for about a year, and and then I had, I had a, a motorcycle without a license, and oh yeah, it was terrible. You know. Wow. I know. Oh my <laughs> gosh, are your parents okay? <laughs> Were they? Uh, okay well, they're gone that? now. <laughs> I, I don't know that I ever told them about the the, the bar. Uh, to be honest, yeah. 
Wow. Yeah, it was quite a life. I actually, I set my parents' barn on fire when I was six by uh, uh, pl- playing with matches. And, you know, I mean, I was just <laughs> out of control. <laughs> well, you know what? As you were kind of saying what you were doing, collecting the balls and everything, I mean, see, need, fill a need. Like, you were making it happen. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah, true. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so why don't you say a little bit about this? Um, so there started your um, entrepreneurism and um, exploration, uh, curiosity. And I know we'll dive into it as we kind of go on, but it's led you to a you know, to where you are now. Yeah, I have, I have a spectacular job. Like I'm so lucky. I, 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 something clicked when I, when I was in my late teens and I, I got to, uh, I got motivated and, and I very quickly rose up the ladder in a, in a small company I was working in. And then they eventually transferred me to Western Canada to be a, a manager. And then I left that company and went, worked as a, got tapped on the shoulder to go into sales. Um, and uh, ended up being the top performer a couple of years in a row for a national company. And then they, they tapped me and put me into management. What a mistake that was. And uh, that didn't work out as well as it did, but I learned, I really learned what not to do. Um, and, uh, and then I went to work as a, a manager of another company and it rose up to vice president. And, and then I opened a consulting firm uh, back, back in Calgary again. I was in Montreal then. And uh, uh, and set that up, and that went. That just took off. It went really well. Um, mm-hmm. And here I am today, in the middle of all of that. I, I worked as a COO of a of a very large boutique uh, oil and gas service company with offices all over the world. And and I just learned. I've, I've learned a lot to you know of what to do and what not, more what not to do <laughs> than what to do. But uh, that's that's what happens. Yeah. And so here I am today with this uh, consulting business where I, I coach and I train and and I uh, uh, advise and help people with strategic plans and things like that. It's a lot of fun. So when you said that the first management, I'm not sure if you said it was the first management position, but you said it was a mistake. Yeah. Were you too young or why was it a mistake? Yeah, because I, I had a lot of energy, but I didn't have a lot of, of uh, compassion, I think, and pragmatism at the time and, and uh, empathy. So I, I, you know, I was a, a crusher sales guy, but I would, I would turn that around internally and, and really it was damaging to, to, to what I was doing as a manager, you know. So, yeah, it, but so I guess was it a mistake? Not really, because I learned a lot. Yeah, I love those words, though, compassion and empathy, because you do really have to have that at the top, don't you? I, I mean, think so, yep. Yeah, to, I mean, truly be successful. There are people that are one could see as successful, but they don't have that, and there's a lot missing. A hundred percent. You know, compassion. Compassion is a very interesting human trait because it, as it, 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 it's, a, it's a sword that cuts both ways. You, you swing it one way. And, and you help people out and you help people be successful and it's, it's just as it's fantastic and you swing it the other way. And sometimes we're overly compassionate mm-hmm. and, and p- people get into trouble over that. And, you know, you don't see compassion in a lot of other species on the planet, only in humans, really. Yeah, that's a really, really good point, though, because it's true. It does go both ways. There's that side of really helping, um, that, uh, being empathetic, um, empathic. But then when you're too empathic, then it kind of overcomes you and you don't feel good. Yeah. Yeah. You know, without sounding too morose here, I, I, if you look at, uh, I mean, we, we finally have euthanasia laws in Canada, uh, you know, to support people if they, if they want to, you know, call it, call it quits. But for a long time, we felt it was compassionate to people, keep people alive who just simply didn't want to be alive, you know, and that's, that's an example of as awful as that sounds, an example of it swinging the other way right yeah i have to say um a f- person named fred cohen um which is actually my mother's second cousin i think uh-huh. he was a huge person um in getting those laws going um an advocate within the u.s for um the right to die basically 
yeah, it's it's needed, you know. Yeah. But anyway. Yeah. 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 Anyway. Okay. So <laughs> on that happy <laughs> note. <laughs> so let's move to our would you rather question. <laughs> and then we'll dive into our first question. Okay. So and to acknowledge, thank you, those that are here live. I appreciate you. Um, so Chuck, would you rather never listen to music or never watch TV? Oh boy. Uh Never, never watch TV. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Music is just so important. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Quick answer. Yeah. <laughs> Do yeah. you want me to expand on that? <laughs> no, it's okay. I totally agree. I was kind of like, anytime I pick these questions, I think about it for myself. And I'm like, oh, it's a hard one. My daughter and I watch a romantic comedy like every night before we go to sleep. And it's like such a a nice bonding experience and love movies, but I can't imagine never having music. Okay. Hold on. Are you, so you, you go to the, the Hallmark channel and no. watch a different romantic. Okay. No. Okay. <laughs> no Hallmark channel. She wouldn't allow that. <laughs> uh, what's the last one you watched? Um, what did we watch yesterday? Um, what women want? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Good for you. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's many. We either choose our, and not to spend too much time on it, we choose like, okay, well, which one are we going to watch that we've seen about 100 times, like the proposal that we can turn it off 15 minutes in because we're going to go to sleep, or <laughs> be daring and choose a different one. <laughs> Love Actually. <laughs> Love Actually, seen that many times. Yeah, 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 that's a killer. Yeah. <laughs> you like that one? Yeah, that's a good one. Yep. Yeah, that is a good one. So, okay, so let's dive into this. So, Chuck, first question, how do you define creativity? You know, as you know, you, you threw these questions at me a little while ago, and I thought about it a lot. And, uh, uh, you know, I think, I think I, right out of the gate, you've got to see creativity as a game changer anywhere. You know, now I'm a business guy, right? So, I mean, mm -hmm. I, a lot of the way I will direct, I, I communicate and talk, I realize a lot of the things I talk about can be used in personal life, but I tend to relate in business. So, so, you know, I see it as a, as a game changer in business. And there's a theory I have, which is, is you're either leading or following, there's no middle ground, you know, and, and you have to think in terms of, of uh, if you're doing something very well, don't think about whether your competitors will do it. Think about when will they do it because they're going to come after you and, and they're going to find a way to do it. And, and it doesn't matter what you're doing. Even if you have patents, somebody will find a way around it. So you have to have creativity inside your organization. You, you have to. And you have to allow for it. And you have to have innovation. Um, you know, I, I have, I did this year, but for the last four or five years, I, I would attend this innovation conference in London. And it was the coolest thing. You know, there were only about 150 people there. And it would be like a one day, one and a half day event. And you, you'd, you'd have the, the head of Google and the head of YouTube and the, the head of innovation for Twitter and, and uh, British Telecom and all these, these, these major corporations, these people would come in and speak. And, and I'd be sitting in this room, you know, with, with 150 people listening to them. And I'd be surrounded by people that work for corporations whose titles were Director of Innovation, VP of Innovation, mm -hmm. Head of Innovation, Chief Innovation Officer, and and they're, they're so ahead of us over there in that regard. Like, when's the last time you ran into somebody corporately in this in this country, or in the United States for that matter, that had a title of innovation in their in their? Oh, it's so rare, right? I I can think of one, and yeah. and so they they take this innovation and they they push it, it becomes a line item inside the business and it, and it drives creativity and it drives advancement. Um, and, and I think that's, it's extremely important. In, in North America, we tend to fall into creativity and innovation, whereas over there, they, 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 it's, it's a push, if that makes any sense. So the falling into is almost kind of accidental? Corporately, you see it a lot. Somebody, somebody's messing around with something and they go, oh, look at this. I created something. Yep. Yeah. See it a lot. I love that analogy. And I'm wondering, is it, was it such a small amount of people because they were chosen um, or just because it's not really, uh, why, why so small? Uh, invite only. 
small okay. venue. Uh, okay. uh, yeah, you know, and uh, really cool people. And yeah, yeah, I mean, it, the, yeah, it's just the way it was structured. It's been structured. Yep. Which is great because it's really for those people that are really it applies to in their focus. It's not just this broad thing of, Oh, come check it out. But it's like, you're serious. Oh yeah. Yeah. And you come away and your mind is blown, like completely blown. You know, I mean, I, if you go to my Insta or my uh, LinkedIn or whatever, you'll see a picture of me standing with the, the, the chief innovation officer for, uh, for uh, YouTube. And here's this dude, you know, in the, one of the largest organizations out there in this in this new space, and and he's he's explaining what YouTube does and how it works, and 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 the creativity it's brought forward, and and how you how you commercialize it. You're just sitting there and going, okay, I have to leave now because this my my brain is full. Right. So, what would be? I mean, what do you see as like the chief um, innovative officer or? What would you see that would be somewhat comparable or what in the States and in Canada, like in the North America, what well, we the, would think would be that role? We don't really see it. You may, you may see an engineer. You may see uh, a certain group of people that have a sandbox inside their organization for idea generation and, and creation, but they don't necessarily apply the creativity. So let me, yeah, let me clarify that too. In these, these roles, Instead of just having an engineering department that's going out and creating something new, or an IT or uh, IT development company that's messing around with with different types of software and apps, they they say let's be creative and innovative in every part of our organization. So not just in our products. How about in our how about in our, our with our clients? How about with our employees? How about with with uh, with our our vision and our mission and our values? So I'll give you an example. What's happening with COVID right now? Is there's there's two very converging uh, pieces that are that are happening here. Number one is is that they say one out of four people is planning to leave their job once they once it goes back to normal. Number two is is that sixty seven I think percent of Canadians are saying they don't really want to go back to the office. They like working from home. So you've got that in, on one side, and over on this other side we've got this thing called mental health, and there's all sorts of studies saying that the mental health is mental health is going to be fragile. Uh, coming out of COVID for some period of time. And we're seeing that ramp up already too, where the psychologists have no time to speak to people and blah, blah, blah. So what, let's be innovative in a company. If we know that that 67% of our people don't want to come back and if we know that we risk losing one out of four, why don't we create a mental health strategy inside our organization that's going to cause the cut, the the employees to say, hey, this is actually a place I wouldn't mind working at because mm. they're thinking about the future state for me. And and so it's not just a health spending account. It's a mental health yes. experience. And, and to, to different, not to babble too much on this, but to, 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 to for different people, mental health is different. Some people may want to go see a psychologist, but some people might want to be able to take a day off and walk through the mountains. Like who knows, right? Yeah, yeah. No, I think this is a perfect area to spend time talking about, which is why I have you as who you are, but a business person sharing your perspectives, because this is different light, you know, than other people, than the doctor that I've had on and the lawyer that I've had on. It's hearing these different perspectives and these stories, because that's a huge, it's huge what you're saying. I mean, mental health, <laughs> like, and actually giving people a reason why that would be attractive as to why they would want to go into an office instead of just like, oh, I have to go into the office um, to give them a reason. All over it, you know, and, and so that would be at the sort of thing that a chief innovation officer would be doing, would be looking out and trying to connect the dots on what the future state's going to look like and where can we improve here and where can we improve there, not just in our products, but throughout the entire organization. And, and I think that is, is ridiculously missed in North America. I, I never see that. I see very innovative engineering departments. I see very innovative IT groups, but, but no, no overall objective that, that they're going to be innovative throughout the entire organization. So it's this holistic view, like going to a, um, I, I compare it to like going to a naturopath. Uh, as a as a, a doctor per se, and um, seeing you as a whole person, and okay, you're feeling this, but what are you eating? Are you drinking? What are you drinking? Are you sleeping enough? Are you do you have a lot of stress? Like looking at you as a whole person and seeing what's kind of going on in order to make a determination of 
why you're feeling that way. I love that. I, I think you are, you're absolutely spot on. Like I had a conversation with coaching with one of my clients this morning. We're, we get together once a week and just talk for an hour. <coughs> Excuse me. And, and he was telling me about the fact that he's, he's got his business running much, much faster than it has before. So now he's got highs and lows. And I said, well, you know, in your lows, you should have something in your back pocket, plan B, like training or professional development for your people. So when you hit the low, let them go get, uh, get involved and, and develop. And, uh, and when your highs are on, they can perform at optimally. So you've got that going on, right? And he said, well, how much, how much should we spend on training? What, what should I budget for that? So I said, okay, let me ask you this. You've got, you've got a very asset heavy business. You've got a lot of equipment. How much do you spend annually to maintain that equipment? You know, make sure the bearings are, are proper, uh, make sure the software is up to date, replacing parts. Uh, how much would you spend? And he said, well, I'm not sure. And I said, I'll bet you spend between five and 10% of their asset value. And he said, yes, that, you know, that would be correct. I said, so how much do you spend on your soft assets, your people? You, you spend 10% on your hard assets. How much do you spend on your soft assets? And he said, no, nothing. I said, yeah, like, does that make sense to you? You know, yeah. and he went, nope, I got it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and so we spent spending that on people so that they're happy and productive. You really, boy, I'm on a roll here, but you really want to take away the worry, yeah. you know, for people to get their job done. Because that's the thing that slows people down. They're not going to tell you. They're not going to say, "I'm right now I'm sitting at my computer and I'm worried about something. You know, they won't tell you that. But what we need to do is pull that out of there so that they can be totally productive while they're there and have a really good experience and want to come back the next day. Right, right. I'm thinking of, uh, like, my husband is a TV film editor. And um, he we live in New Jersey, and he would commute up to New York, which is only, like, you know, it's an hour and 15, 20 minutes. And he would get so excited about certain days of having like bagel day and pizza day. And he, you know, as he'd be leaving at six in the morning, he's like, it's pizza day today. But it wasn't just order from, you know, some rinky dink place down the street. It was high end pizzas with all different kinds of toppings and white pizza and no sauce, like all this different kinds of stuff, which, got people excited and it was also about community um they would go out for drinks they would create a sense of community and we care and we're treating it as something i love that i i just love that you know and i i can't tell you how many times i've had that conversation with clients and they'll say chuck what's what's the what's one really good thing i could do for my people if i i'd say put in a kitchen Hire a retired uh, cook to come in three or four days a week. And so that when your staff show up at, at seven in the morning, they, they smell fresh cinnamon buns. And, and at lunch, they can smell the onions because it's, it's – and they still, they'll never leave, you know? And, yeah. and only one that I know of has ever done it, and it was just brilliant, right? Yeah, it's so – and even like being a teacher, so, you know, all of the – the you know the stress that can incur throughout a day and all this kinds of stuff it's those little things even like the littlest things of like when my supervisor would come around with like a little heart saying thank you mrs citron for all you do a little bag of candy it was just like that's so nice yes yep yep perfect <laughs> it's appreciated absolutely absolutely well you know another thing i think about creativity if i could Mm -hmm. go on that a little Please. more is is that is that it's gonna it's gonna come at you and so i've i've met a lot of business people over the years that will say we've got a really good culture in this company and i want to preserve it we want to preserve our culture want to you know and and i without a doubt i've seen that that fall apart a, a bazillion times that you cannot preserve a culture i i heard this this fellow speak 25 years ago about uh, in Quebec and in Quebec, they've always, uh, Canada, they've always said, we want to preserve our culture, you know? And he said, look, if you, the only way to preserve a culture is to put it in a Petri dish and kill it and, and put an embalming fluid over it. And then you'll have that culture and it'll be <laughs> preserved. He said, you can't preserve a culture. And I've learned that over the years that you can't too, that, that, that a, it's a snapshot in time. You know, some senior executive has a really good day that companies just, just doing really well. He's, it, it's Friday night. He's having a scotch or she's having a scotch sitting in the hot tub thinking, 
wow, we've got it. We've got it now. Let's try to hold on to this. It's not going to happen. And because people are going to come in and they're going to be want, want to be a part of it. They're going to want to want to help change it. And they've got ideas and they've got creativity. And I think if if the if the if the senior people can wrap their head around the fact that they're never going to preserve their culture, but what they can do is they can it can be innovated and adapted and and grown by those new faces and those new people that come in. Now you're cooking with gas. And that, and that just inspires creativity inside organizations, right? God, so it's like it's evolving. Yes. You're constantly evolving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The idea of I'm going to take this square peg and pound it into this round hole. Yeah. You know, that's as old as the hills, right? It doesn't work. Doesn't work at all. Oh, my gosh. It's so funny. It's So my son just got done a stint working at UPS. And... Um, you know, sorry, not to diss. Uh, he was working the three in the morning to nine shift and just the repetition of like the boxes and, you know, putting them on the conveyor belts where everything should go. And all that's involved in that, like on the back end, <laughs> there's, it's literally almost like um, Lucille ball, like with the chocolate uh, moving on the conveyor belt. Like yep. if you don't keep up with it, the boxes fall. <laughs> so, right. and especially during COVID, there was such a, you know, uh, uptick in all of the everything with Amazon and everything being sent, there's just a ton of boxes. It wasn't just Christmas season once. It was like all year and a half, oh, you know, yeah. or how long it's been going. But they were stingy in even giving them a bottle of water. Like for a six hour shift. It's like, seriously? Well, I, I, <laughs> I'll, I'll go there right <laughs> now and I'll. I'll, I'll leave this behind, but it, it, it absolutely baffles my mind why the wealthy, except for Bill Gates, uh, he's done some, by why the wealthiest people on this planet, like Bezos and Buffett, do not, <laughs> are not putting out this COVID fire with the reams of cash they have uh, and, and, and looking at their employees better, like mental health or a bottle of water. I mean, these these companies are making so much profit and I, I'm a capitalist. I am, mm -hmm. but they're making so much and they're not doing anything. And it's the midsizers that are in there uh, helping out, you know, it's, yeah. it's just, it's just, a, I should stop now. Cause I yeah. get on a box there. Yeah. 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 I know. I know. Okay. So let's move on to the second question <laughs> and let's see where we go with this. So um, how do you actually, um, you know, we know you're in business and everything and we can talk on that, but if you want to expand on how do you actually incorporate creativity into your own life? Well, so for me, it's, it's mostly uh, business again. And so I have a few standard operating procedures that I, that I use. I mean, I, or I, I like good models and I think models are important. Now, I, I do think you should go down the rabbit hole and I do go down the rabbit hole a lot. In fact, my, I'm a terrible Instagram rabbit hole person, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's terrible. For somebody my age, you shouldn't be doing that. But the, um, it's easy. It's yeah, easy. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's so easy. But, but I, I, I have a few models. Like I, I have one around uh, uh, people, process, environment, technology. And I'll, I'll say if you're going to do something inside your organization or with yourself or people consider the people consider your process consider what the the environment's going to look like that you're going to be doing this in and what sort of technology is required and so i i i can go way off track and if i'm leading a group uh we can go way off track with the post notes and, and what should we do here and what about this what about that but i always go back to those four and say have we got something in all four of these categories you know are we are we looking in all four of these these areas. Um, and I, I have a, a belief that the secret to success in business is to, is to create great decision makers, you know? And so you do that through them being creative in their decision-making process as well. And how's it fit and where does it go? Um, I think that, uh, I think you have to have certain things in place, like certain structure. I believe high, high performance people, highly creative people are actually attracted to structure. Some, somebody might be laughing right now and low, low, <laughs> low, low performance, low creative people aren't, but you know, even, even artists will start off with a canvas and they'll say, okay, I always paint my canvas orange and I always do this and I always do that. And then I go here and then I go there and other artists, you know, draw it in first, then go back in and fill it in. And, 
and 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 that's how you get beautiful art rather than chaos. Now, admittedly, sometimes artists get so good at it that they start to produce chaotic artwork that gets sold based on their reputation, but probably not in the beginning. And and so to avoid chaos, you've got to have some some order in place uh, to do that. So I'm a, I'm a big believer in having few models. Like I I even think in our life we have. I t- people talk about uh, work life life balance. I say, well, that doesn't exist. I'm going down a rabbit hole right now. Okay, <laughs> go ahead, keep going. It, it, but it doesn't exist. It's health, career, and relationship. It's a balance. It's a it's a juggle. And you you have your health, and you have your career, and you have your relationships. And these are these are the the vehicles you drive ultimately to to your end. You know, and if you if you look after your health really well, and if you look after your career, and if you look after your relationships, you'll have a really good ride. You know, mm-hmm. and and so there's things like that, and and I think when you have that in place, then you you you, you allow creativity, and and that's certainly how I incorporate it in, in, into my life. Uh, that that, and I guess the other thing is, is I I like to see what other people are doing all the time, and uh, and wonder about it, and say, okay, well, I wonder how that would fit. Just just like that mental health thing earlier, you know, what what's on one end, what's on the other end, and so what what could happen in the middle. I, I think that's that's a really important way to do it. Mm-hmm. And go down the rabbit holes. Go. Yeah. Like, go down the rabbit holes. I love that. I'm putting this down in bold letters. Um, <laughs> go down the rabbit holes. Because it's kind of, um, it's free thinking that way. It's kind of, it's like, you know, um, Ah, it's like when a poet is just, you know, I can't think of the words right now, but just uh, free flowing and just speaking on the spot. When you're going down that rabbit hole, one thing's leading to another. It's just kind of the ebb and flow, right? Yeah, it, it's, you know, I, it was funny. I, one of my, I've had one of my clients I've known for 23 years uh, brought, brought this up the other day when we were chatting and I'd forgotten about it back in the day. I used to talk about how, a good conversation is, I was like snorkeling and he brought it up and I went, Oh my God, I remember that. I used to say, that. I said, yeah, yeah. You know, and I, I, it used to be this, I used to say, so if, if, if you really know you're having a creative and interesting conversation, if it's like snorkeling and you're, 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 you're taking a big, big deep breath and you're going down into the water, you know, and you're having this conversation and you're going deep and you're, you're really into it and you're, you know, everything's happening and then whoosh, you got to come up for air, you know, and you have to because mm-hmm. you'll, you'll drown in your idea, right? If, if you stay down there too long. So you kind of come up for air and then go back down again. And, and it's so funny. I guess he still teaches his people that, which is quite a compliment. Well, it's a great analogy. It's a great visual. I mean, you can totally see that. It's true. You kind of, one thing leads to another and you're like, uh, and you're like, ah, like you can totally see that with the snorkel. Yeah, well, even the way that you're you're uh, presenting your program is it still has structure, doesn't it? It has yeah. these three questions. Yeah, and uh, and and so you can get into them, and then you can come back out, take a breath, and go back down again. And, exactly. Uh, my, I had a a, fr- a colleague, friend, client, uh, John John Vandervelden was his name, and I he passed away a few years ago, but I used to die to have lunch with that guy because. We would snorkel like, <laughs> you know, and he was always in the moment with you. You knew when you were talking with him that that you were the only one, and mm-hmm. and because you were the only one, he was the only one, and and you, we'd get into some crazy subjects, you know. Okay. I think you're making a good point, though. I mean, there's so much of distracted conversation; it can be so one-sided. Um, especially with technology and everything, uh, people being interrupted with the, the ding, the, the, the ring, the something, not, a, you know, well, there's just distractions. Oh, there you go. There is an interesting thought too. You're saying, how do I incorporate creativity or what do I do to make, keep myself in that space? I, years ago, I shut off all my reminders. Uh, like all my, uh, my, my, uh, computer doesn't ding and I don't get a little flag on my messages and I don't, my text doesn't come up to saying somebody's texted me. Uh, none of that, because if I want to shut, if I want to put that phone to a silent ring, I don't want to be seeing anything because it's just distracting. Keeps you off track. You know? 
which I think actually goes back to that health career relationships. Oh. That's finding. Well, I feel like it's finding that healthy balance because in order to have better relationships, you're monitoring when you're available to others within your business and when you're, you know, when you're where. So it's not like you have to be available and a completely open book for everybody at all times. You're establishing some boundaries. Well, it's a red badge of courage for a lot of people, right? Um, do, you, do you know that story? No, tell me. Well, in the, I think it was the Civil War in the United States. The, uh, the uh, soldiers used to have white rags that were you know, soaked in their own blood, stuffed in their back pockets. And that showed that they were courageous people because they'd been out to fight. And, uh, and so the red badge of courage today is, is often, you know, how many calls I took that day and how, 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 how much I put up with and how much I fought, and how far I drove to work and how long I was stuck in traffic and all that kind of stuff. It's like a competition sometimes. And it, it's, uh, it's, it's crazy, you know, yeah. to, to be so tied up like that. Yeah, it is. And it um, it just affects your ability to breathe <laughs> because you're so you're moving, moving, moving. It's like you're not really breathing. Um, no, you're just you're just moving. And I have to say, like for I'd made the choice to leave my uh, teaching job already. But when all of this uh, with COVID kicked in, my husband was still uh, he was he's a freelancer and he was I think his last gig, he was going to Pennsylvania, which in traffic could still be an hour and a half. Without traffic, it was 20 minutes. Um, but you know, everything came to a stop and he hadn't stopped in so many years that he just didn't realize what he was doing, that he really wasn't breathing. You know, he'd yeah. be up at three in the morning because that's just what he does anyway. Uh, he does his morning routine. He's at the door by six. He would be, you know, if he was going up to New York, he'd be on the train and then, you know, everything. And he wouldn't get home until eight or nine at night and start it all over again. Yep. Yep. So when everything stopped, he was kind of like, oh my God. Yep. Like he was breathing and he was like, wow, I can actually be with family. Our kids are older, but, but still it's not the window of them being out of the house yet. Yep. Yep. I know. I know. I, I take it through a lot of people for a loop. It's been quite a, quite a, quite a challenging time. I, I, I find COVID has made me a, a kinder person. Um, and, and I, I, I don't know why, but, uh, I, I find myself more, <laughs> this is so awful, more, more tolerant than I've, than I've been <laughs> over, over my years, you know? And, and when I see someone who's, you know, at the side of the road with a sign, I'll, I'll give him twenty dollars, and uh, you know, and, and stuff like stuff like I never used to do, to be honest. And uh, I mean, my wife and I both had COVID in June, and then we've we've uh, we both got over it. We weren't hospitalized or anything, and then we had uh, uh, we both had long hauls, and and you sort of sit back and you go, wow, you know, this this is tough on people. It's it's really really tough on people. We need to be kinder right now, you know. You were actually, I understand the sense of being, you know, compassionate, but you actually went through it. You had like a little eye-opening event there. You were in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And back when it was early days. So really people didn't really know a lot about it at that time, like we do now, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, but, all, but also just to see, and, 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 and even I was donating my plasma for science and, and the work that these these uh, nurses were and caregivers were, were giving to people, you know, were donating their blood and keeping this machine moving and everything. It was just phenomenal, you know, when you, when you look at that. It's really mm -hmm. cool. Wow. Well, I'm really glad that you and your wife are okay. Yeah, yeah, so are we. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thankful for that. Can I, can I add something about, about uh, how, to, how, how to incorporate it? Please, um, yes. Creativity thing. Yeah, you don't have to ask, yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think it's important to be a student of this world. That's going to sound so uh, coming from an old salty dog businessman, but I, I, I will tell people that all the time that I, that I work with as well, is that if, if you're going to, especially salespeople, if you're going to present yourself as an expert, I can pretty well promise you, uh, you're not going to get too far. But if you if you 
position yourself as a student. And if you, if you walk into an experience and say, instead of me thinking I know it all, I'm going to be curious and try to understand what I can learn and what I can know and from this person. It's shocking how different things uh, look from that angle, you know? And so if you're a student of this planet, like, why is that happening? Why do we do this? Why does this go on? And, and to try to, to look at it that way, I think that really opens up the creative and the innovation uh, juices in people. I really do. Oh, my gosh. I love that. Thank you so much for saying that. Because, um, yeah, as you were saying it, I'm thinking, well, isn't that then bringing just the ego into everything? I mean, who really wants to listen to somebody that's like, I'm the expert. I know everything. You have to listen to me. People are just like, no, I don't. <laughs> like, no. I, don't I don't even want to talk to you. <laughs> You know, I will ask people lots of times, I'll say, uh, uh, wait, and, and Paul, you were a teacher. I'll say, think about the best teachers you had in school. Think about them for a minute. When you ask them questions, what did they do? And that, and that's a lot of people go, go glassy eyed on that. And then I'll say, did they, did they throw the question back at you? And they go, oh yeah, oh yeah, for sure. All the time. Yep. Think about it, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, and are we doing that as well? Of course, if I did that with my my wife, she'd probably hit me in the head. <laughs> That's a different okay. scenario. <laughs> but I have to say, like being what I found in the classroom and really in any situation is that um, people are grateful when you apologize and you acknowledge that you made a mistake. There are multiple times within the classroom that I'd be like, oh, I didn't handle that well, or I didn't get the information across the way I wanted. And sometimes because there was a lot of behaviors to be dealing with at one time, and sometimes it just didn't go well on a certain day. And the next day I'd come in and say, you know what, I really apologize. I didn't handle that well, and I wasn't really listening. And I just wanted to you know, let you know that. And the room would go quiet. Uh, because there's just, it's creating a safe space, yeah. you know? And that's a pressure cooker job. Hey, Oh man, I don't, I do, I do not envy teachers today because the, there's so many, not all of them, but there's so many parents out today that expect the government to raise their children and expect, expect, you know, it, uh, and, and the government, when I say that, I'd say the teaching establishment as well, rather than taking responsibility for, for uh for it themselves you know it's 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 a tragedy um yeah there is um but i think it's just humanism but actually wondering like how does that work within the business place i mean in having those higher up positions if um you know uh, a chief executive officer is admitting to making a mistake would that happen oh yeah sure yep a good one mm-hmm yeah. Although that's a tough, you know, <laughs> it's lonely at the top uh, when you're in that space too, though. And, and, and uh, without sounding terribly brutal, a lot of times when you're up in that very, very, very top, there's a lot of challenges you're up against. And what one is, is a lot of people have a knife out for you, essentially, that they, they're, there's a lot of people that do want to see you fail. Um, and, and that happens a lot. Um, you can be on the top of a, of a, Ant hill and somebody else is on the top of a of a uh, mountain and you can both be feel threatened by each other because because you're both on the top there's that issue and then another issue is has been that reference to a mountain there's a, a whole pile of ways that you can approach a mountain uh, you know as you as you climb to, to be an executive and lots of ways to enter although you know, theoretically there's probably one or two trails but lots of ways to get onto that mountain but once you get up to the top there's really only one way to crest it and so you have to get better and better at that as you, as you move along and it's tough that's a tough job you know it's it's, it's a tough job great visuals you're like painting these pictures <laughs> that i'm seeing in my mind as you're speaking <laughs> that little ant on top of that that ant hill <laughs> <laughs> the samurai sword <laughs> like ksh, ksh. oh my gosh going this is totally different i don't know why i'm saying it it's just because it has to do with ants was walking the other day and there was this poor 
warm that because it's been so oh. warm here, <laughs> it couldn't make it. And we were laughing. My husband and I are walking and we're like, unfortunately, the worm didn't make it to the other side. The worm was probably like, it's so hot. <laughs> and it just like <laughs> died in the middle. And all of these ants were just eating it. I'm like, oh, oh. my God, that's so nasty. <laughs> oh, that's, that's, that's humanity. Or not humanity. It's uh, <laughs> nature. Yeah. It is nature. Uh, combination. <laughs> anyway. Oh, my God. Okay. So let's get to this third question is to kind of sum it up. So why is creativity important? Well, I think it goes back to some of the things I said earlier uh, around it being a game changer. You know, um, uh, you know, it's in innovation is a game changer and creativity is required for innovation. And, and if you're if you're not going to take a take a look from all angles as to what you're doing, uh, you've got a problem. Like I have a I have a I've, I'm full of expressions, right? And and one of them is don't shoot the aliens. You know, like don't shoot the aliens. They've they've shown up. Let's have a look at what this is all about. Let's take our time. Let's let's try to understand what uh, what's what's a, what's about to happen here because it, they could actually be a lifesaver for us we don't know you know and and so when something comes along try to be creative and understand what what do you think it it, it could do because it can be a game changer for, for for people for companies you know don't shoot the aliens yeah yeah because it's that crazy idea or that crazy thing that as you're going down that rabbit hole and it could just be like a complete, you don't notice it at all, or, you know, it doesn't look familiar, but it's a game changer. It is a game changer. Like I, I, I'm old enough to remember that when I was in grade three, my teacher said to said, boys, you can be astronauts or cowboys or engineers, or you can do all this stuff. And girls, you can be housewives, nurses, or teachers. Right. 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 And, yeah. and I remember working for a fella who, uh, this goes back 30 years now, who would not hire a woman. And I'm going, well, why? Nope, nope, nope not going to do it. What? You know, like, <laughs> this is insane. Nancy worked with me over at this company. I'm going to hire her because she's fantastic. And, and mm -hmm. he, because he, uh, he would shoot the aliens, right? Like he couldn't handle it. He, he, would, he would, so what ends up happening is, is you completely restrict yourself from, from, uh, from, you know, immediately cut off half your available pool, immediately cut off half of your idea pool, immediately cut, like, it's just nuts, you know? So you have to, t and, and that goes for diversity as well, whether it's, <laughs> let's face it, whether it's race or religion or gender or, or, or whatever it is, you know, mm -hmm. like, you're going to miss something <laughs> by, mm -hmm. by, by doing that, if that makes sense. Definitely makes sense. Yeah, it's, it's sticking to this, it's sticking to these paradigms. It's sticking to these old ways of belief and um, not evolving. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's a good point too, Hollis, is, is you just nailed it, is, is innovation is, it creates evolution. And, or maybe it goes the other way around. Evolution creates innovation, you know? Oh, no, that was too deep. <laughs> Get the scuba gear. <laughs> yeah, go, go, go get the bong. <laughs> so my son's been waiting to hear from me. Those words come out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> so, so does innovation create evolution or does in evolution create innovation? Oh, man. Audience, we would love to hear from you about that. Put That's your thoughts. <laughs> Put your thoughts in the chat box there and anybody listening to the replay, seriously. I mean, yeah. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh no. I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to go to bat on that one now for the next <laughs> month. <laughs> see, and, 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 and just, you see, I have a very screwed up mind, right? So that's where all that comes from. <laughs> screwed up minds are good. That's what leads to evolution. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you want my mind to be part of the evolution, but I'll go with it. Sure. Yeah. I mean, seriously, that's how, like, I got this idea, you know, many of my ideas that have come to me for things like my husband and I were literally walking in Philadelphia and we saw this, um, this idea that I'm about to birth soon, which I'm not ready to really talk about yet, but I saw 
like this um this it's like a group biking experience and they're drinking and they're singing and they're pedaling and there's somebody leading them and i turned to my husband i'm like what could i do within what i do to create that kind of feeling and within an hour we had to figure it out like it it was that kind of thing i just that kind of the innovation came from, I guess it sparked. There was a concept sparked. And we we're going back and forth, back and forth. The idea grew within an hour. And then I've been feeding it for a while where now it's ready to like soon be birthed. But um, it can just take those little things. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, a, and, and what is it? It's a physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual. That's another model that I think a lot about. And uh, my wife, especially, she's she is well, she is a creative energizer, but she but she can go down a rabbit hole, and boy, she's down. But she's she runs this business. It's a fitness uh, uh, training uh, uh, fitness instructors in indoor cycling. So she mm-hmm. and she has a team of people, and they fly all over the place right now. They do it all on Zoom. She's trained thousands and thousands of people how to put on these spin classes, you know, Mm -hmm. but, but she also has this. And so she, she's creative in how she she does that, but she also has this swag business where she, she produces all these really creative and cool uh, shirts with these great sayings and, and, uh, uh, and she's just rocking it in that space. Right. It's really, really neat. Why was I going there? But, Oh, I, I know. So, so the physical, emotional, intellectual, spiritual piece, says that that if if you if you want to be creative again you've got to be a physical self uh and then you then once you become physical your emotions start to kick off like you're going for a walk right okay you're doing something physical uh, it's hard to get out of a chair sometimes but once you get up and you get going you're moving the walk and you see something and you get emotional and you go wow that's pretty cool because the physical has triggered the emotion and then the the emotion you're going wow i like that i love that that's so cool what we could do triggers the intellectual and let's think it through and then you think it through and and boom it becomes a spiritual thing because it now becomes inside you right you go wow i could do this this is so cool and and it's it's there's a connection between those and so tash being a a instructor i watch her like if she if she rides the bike and she just gets juiced up and kaboom, she's she's figuring something out, blah, 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 you know, and and she has to do that. So some people have to do that. But anyway, there's a connection there that that's just so interesting on in how that works. You know, that's that. Yeah, I love that word connection. And if you're a spin instructor, how could you be like low energy? That is. <laughs> Those two don't go together. <laughs> like that's you can't just be like da, 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 da. now you go up this way. No, you have to be through the roof because I'm to tell you the truth, I don't want to be there. So if uh, I if I get myself there, you have to raise my vibration to like be there. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. And it's 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 crazy. Now she's been at it for a long time and now she has a team, but she has planted her enthusiasm and energy uh in in thousands of people and you know it's really interesting because we all know shit rolls downhill right well well so (laughs) does energy enthusiasm excitement uh power uh uh engagement inclusiveness it all happens at the top right and if you act that way it rolls down inside and she's taught so many not to to brag too much about her but she's taught so many people how to do that very thing it's remarkable you know it really is Oh, my gosh. Okay, so enthusiasm, energy, power, engagement, it rolls down to reach others. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, ask yourself that question. You you walk in anywhere, walk into a store, you know, you walk into the, like in in, in Phoenix, Arizona, you walk into a store and people say, hey there, how you doing today? And you automatically feel fantastic, right? (laughs) Right. Because it's just rolling in like that. Yeah. Yeah, because some people, I mean, it's just not expected. It's so crazy. I hear I'm going to brag about it again. It's so crazy to see that because she she puts on these indoor cycling classes and you think it was uh, classes for instructors. So yeah, they're energy people and they come and they learn how to put on a class and everything else. And it's really, really good. And you'd expect that to be it. But if you go to her Google uh, reviews, 
uh, she's uh, you'll see 150 reviews on there. They're all five star, and and half more than three quarters of them say that was the most amazing uh, con- uh, community in- inclusive experience I've ever had in my life. You've changed my life. Uh, this you know the blah blah blah. It's all about it's all about emotion and intellectual. It's not about physically teaching a class. These people come in and they come out just totally energized. And so that's a secret that happens in that space, right? Anyway. Talk but I, I, no, I think what you're pointing out, though, is really important because I think when you go back to you saying that business, you know, within the space, it's a game changer with innovation. When you're providing, commu- when you're creating a communal space, when you're making people feel included, then people, then it's a life changer. Because people want to show up, people feel like they're being heard, people feel like they have a say, and you know they can be listeners. They're being listened to. It just creates a whole um, energetic space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would agree. Oh God. Okay. So, Chad, please tell people how they can find you. Oh uh, well, my website is the Method Effect. So www.themethodeffect.com. Uh, Chuck at the method effect.com uh, is, is my email and, and people are more than happy to, to chat with people and visit with people. You can find me on LinkedIn, uh, Chuck Bean, I guess. Uh, I don't know, know what the code number is and I'm not on Twitter much. My Instagram looks like a walrus. It's really horrible. <laughs> and, and, uh, but yeah, that's where you can find me. And, and, uh, I, I, always interested in visiting with people. I visited with somebody yesterday from Kansas and we, for a half an hour, we just talked about stuff and, and uh, it's always good. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Well, I'll put all of your information into the bio of this so people can just easily click and find you. And yeah, I mean, before we go to closing, like what would you like to wrap up with? Like giving your final words of advice. My final words of advice would be thank you very much for having me, Hollis. I, I absolutely enjoyed this, this meeting. It was a blast. I, I, it was feel good. And uh, you're, you're awesome. Uh, oh, you're a fantastic interviewer. You've picked a good career. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. I really do. And I appreciate your time. And you just have, you just have such a good vibe about you. You're just putting so much goodness and, it just goes back to the title, you know, starting at a business at age six, you know, so many times we start, we do these things when we're little and then life happens. And um, sometimes we keep doing what interested us when we're younger. Sometimes we get off the path, but it's good to open your eyes and um, see that again, if that's what you need to do. Right, Right on. Cool. You know, so This space is all about inspiring, sharing, and connecting. So please like, follow, and share so we can spread the word and get these good conversations out there, these feel-good conversations that make us think. And if anybody is feeling the need to tell their story, I have um, my business is I Am Creative and Express Yourself Publishing. And I am putting together a multi-author book now called Creativity Is Whatever You Want It To Be. So reach out to me and I would love to have a conversation. So thank you again, Chuck, and thank you for everybody listening. I wish you a wonderful morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in this world. So I'll be talking to you soon. Bye, everybody. Feeling inspired? There are so many ways to do things for you, to get yourself moving, to get your creative juices flowing, and to have fun. Check out I Am Creative and Express Yourself Publishing. Go to IamCreativePhilly.com, IamCreativePhilly, P-H-I-L-L-Y.com, and check out the experiential kits, check out Creative Shui, which is all about creative inspiration and guidance, and for Express Yourself Publishing, there's so many multi-author book opportunities. So I would love to chat with you so much. Everybody has, everybody's creative. Everybody has a voice, everybody has an expression, and I can't wait to meet you. Thank you so much for taking this hour to listen to our stories and share the energy, and I wish you a wonderful morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in this world. Bye, everybody.